ECDC On Air. The podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello and welcome to ECDC On Air. Today's episode features an interview with Joaquin Baruch, who is part of the ECDC EPIAT Fellowship Program for Epidemiologists. Joaquin talks to us about his experiences of being an EPIAT Fellow in Malta, as well as doing field work in places such as Western Sahara, Algeria and Mozambique. This episode was recorded during the Escaide conference in 2022, and we are airing it now to mark the World Field Epidemiology Day, which takes place on the 7th of September. Okay, so uh, we're sitting here today at the Escaide, the second day of the Escaide 2022 conference. Here with me, I have uh, Joaquin Baruch, who has been an EPIAT fellow and has been uh, doing numerous field visits to, well, to Algeria, to West Sahara, and to Mozambique. And he's going to tell us a little bit more now about his experiences and what uh, opportunities there are for doing these kind of things as an EPIAT fellow. So first of all, welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Can you uh, tell us a little bit what, uh, first of all, what motivated you to become an EPIAT fellow? Yeah, so my name is Joaquin. I'm a veterinarian actually by training. And through my veterinary years, I did an internship at FAO, so the Food and Agriculture Organization. And there I worked with another veterinarian that had done the EIS programs, the Epidemic Intelligence Service in the US. And I was, talking one day over a uh, beer after work about what I was wanting to do in the future and he advised me to look into these programs and then I think oh well, it was f- five years after that that after my veteran school I did a PhD in EPI and through that process when I finished I applied to, uh, to EPI. The motivation was in reality to, to continue working on on epidemiology, but move away from academia, which had been uh, most of my my work years, to more applied epidemiology and work in national context. And then you were accepted, uh, mm-hmm. and then uh, you were Spanish, but then you were placed where? Yeah, so I'm Spanish by nationality, but it, I never lived in Spain. I always, uh, I lived in mainly Uruguay, I grew up there. Uh, so I got accepted in May, I think, and in September I started my fellowship in Malta. So you were sitting there in the in the public health authorities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. What were you doing there? It's the MOH, which is the Ministry for Health, um, and within that there is the Infectious Disease uh, Control and Prevention Unit, and within that unit there is uh, Maria, who was my supervisor as an uh, EPIAT, who is also a former EPIAT fellow, and my role was working with her on surveillance and, and outbreak investigation and research. In, in Malta and then of course uh, these international assignments were part of the fellowship but they're not the main objective of the fellowship and that's important to stress that the fellowship is for contributing to the European level but these international assignments have I think have a great advantage for for people doing the fellowship and we can go into detail um, if sure you I'd, I'd love to hear a lot more about that but just in terms of the experience there in Malta is there from an ep- epidemiological point of view, is there anything specific that distinguishes Malta? I mean, geographically, it's a little bit distinct from the rest of Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there any particular diseases there that might not be so prevalent in, in the rest of Europe? Absolutely. And that, and that was, for me, that was part of the reason why I wanted to apply to Malta. So this, I think, a great divide between the countries that host fellows. And that's the... If you go north, basically, you will be working more on um, on foodborne illnesses and STIs. And I mean, that's I'm not speaking for the Nordic countries, but if you go south, you have um, a lot more different challenges. And, and in Malta, I think there is a lot to do when it comes to electronic uh, data. So that is mo- most of the systems are paper based. So if you want to work on developing new systems and for once, establishing surveillance systems, definitely, if you go south, you have more opportunities for that. Because most of the surveillance systems are through manual processes, so you, you do get a lot of um, 
opportunities if you're based in, in places like Malta. And that was the motivation for me was to to be able to do a, a wide range of things and not just focus on super specialized. So it, I before I was in academia in the US, it was very, uh, everything worked perfectly in a way. <laughs> and, and in Malta, that was, um, that was not the case. And, and, and that is not uh, in the, not saying that things in Malta don't work, but there is more room for improvement in places like Malta than in Norway, for example. I see. Uh, but then uh, your these field assignments that you've done, obviously in quite low resource countries, there it must have been uh, very different. It would be very interesting to hear. Can you maybe talk a little bit about your first assignment? Where was that? Was it Mozambique or uh, Algeria? Algeria. Yeah. Okay. So what what did you actually do there? So some background on the context. The um, Western Sahara. It's a territory that used to be under Spanish rule as a colony. I would say. And then the Spaniards left at some point in around the 70s, late 70s. And then that territory became a conflict zone. So then many refugees from there, many, many people there became refugees by fleeing to Algeria. And there is um, a city in the border between Algeria, uh, the territory of West Sahara and Mauritania that hosts around 100,000 people. Uh, and this is the middle of the desert that is there's nothing around yeah. and therefore people live out of international aid mainly so mainly through WFP UNHCR and uh, like 95% of their food is normally through international aid so my role there was to work with the WHO country office and WHO headquarters on a system that is called GoData that is for doing surveillance and contact tracing so we set up that system in the different uh, five camps that there are in the in the refugee camps, and the way it worked was uh, a colleague from the country office and myself went there and stayed there for eight weeks in total, in which we were. It was, it was quite the fun process, and the environment is very challenging, and security was was fine, but because we, there were a lot of measures in place, but it was quite the fun assignment. Uh, we we would get up every morning and and, and hop on the convoy and uh, and drive to the, the refugee camps and, and work with authorities, train the local staff in each one of the hospitals in the refugee camp, teach them how to use the this tool. We gave them tablets and then we monitor how that went on along through the process. And then they had their own leadership that was working on, on setting up the tool and we were providing the, the technical expertise. So then we had roughly, I think, three, three weeks in which we in which we set up the system, and then we had another three weeks in which we monitored the system, how it was working, and then retrain and, and go back to each one of the, the camps and set up with the contact tracers, and they were doing contact tracing for COVID. And, and, and it was, and they're still actually, this was September 2021, and I got a message a couple of weeks ago that they were still using it, and they still were using the same Excel sheet that I had set up for, for doing the analysis and the reporting and and it's I, I think it's quite nice to see that they're they're still using the same system that we that we had built together there. It sounds like it was pretty hands-on work uh, very close to to the patients yeah. themselves because mm-hmm. I, I guess sometimes you have the image of a epidemiologist sitting mainly in front of a computer in an office analyzing data sets and so on but here I guess you were very much part of the implementation of systems and processes you said you work with the contact tracers so you mm-hmm. really came out there yeah of course there were sessions sitting in front of the computer <laughs> but no we were going every morning normally six days a week uh, to the camps and and that meant either the central organization of the camp or the the hospital which is a surveillance unit and then it was we would normally train five to ten people per camp and also the, the the focal point for each camp. And this was, I mean, it's a lot of talking, really. Uh, a lot of training in which you explain a scenario in which a patient comes and then you have to ask a questionnaire of who were the contacts in the last X number of hours. And, and I mean, of course, this, those things are not used anymore for COVID, but the methodologies of setting up a surveillance system uh, still remain. And the principles that they use is the same for COVID, for TB, for... Uh, almost any disease. So then the tool itself, the skills that they learn and that they are implementing are, are the same. So I think our work can be a lot behind a computer, but 
a lot can be also done uh, through actual work and, and, and discussions and, and, and training people. This tool that you mentioned, like, can you explain maybe yeah. a bit briefly just that tool consists of? Yeah, so GoData, it's um, an outbreak investigation slash surveillance, but it's mainly designed for outbreak investigation. Um, that what it does is when you're investigating an outbreak, you want to know who's getting sick and if it's an infectious disease that you want to monitor the contacts, you want to know who the contacts are and what are the periods that you should follow them. So if you, if you think um, COVID, let's say that you get positive, uh, then the authorities will contact you and say, who have you been in the last X number of hours? Do you live with someone? And then the authorities in the, that case, the idea is not to surveil people for control, but it's actually to provide the, the, the healthcare needs that are necessary. So then this tool actually allows you to do that through which uh, through a process in which if you are a contact tracer, you will know who you have to follow uh, each day. So it will give you a list of people that you have to follow. And then after you follow them, you say, oh, the person is healthy, is not healthy. Um, well, hopefully not, but he died. Uh, or you, you can really assign that. And then for the contact tracing team leads, it also allows you to monitor that. So a team lead will be someone that's in charge of several contact traces and you will say, how is my team performing on this? How are, pe are people being followed or not? So it's a tool that simplifies a lot of those things. So you can do it with Excel, you can do it with paper. This tool facilitates that a lot. And it also works offline. So you can collect your data, you can do the case investigation, being talking to the cases and asking their symptoms, their uh, demographics, location, and you can do that all, all on, offline. And then you connect online and upload the data. So that's for those environments in which connection is normally not the best, you can work through this tool to, to work offline and then go back to your hospital in this case where they had a solar panel and they had Wi-Fi and upload the data. So it's a very handy tool. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's quite well adapted to, to, uh, to suit uh, these kind of settings like refugee camps and so on where there might not always be electricity and uh, so on. Yeah, it was used in, in a lot of countries in Europe as well. Um, so that's, I would say, the, the offline part is super handy, uh, but it was also, I mean, it was used in Malta, for example, at the beginning of COVID. It was used in Spain and in many other countries. But it's hosted by GORAN, so the Global Outbreak uh, Alert Response, response Network. Network yeah. Can you uh, just tell us a little bit about the disease profiles there? I mean, was there any particular outbreaks or anything when you were there? So there is, we were focusing on COVID, so really I wouldn't have a lot of uh, information or other things, but I think they had quite a bit of um, tuberculosis, if I'm remembering correctly. And then I think mal malnutrition indicators were also a challenge, which is, uh, is understandable. They are in, in an armed conflict that has been ongoing on for 40 years, uh, 40, and they are in a terrible situation in the middle of the desert. It's, it's, it's not an easy environment. I mean, I was a visitor for eight weeks, but they live there, um, and it's not the same. Yeah, they don't have the opportunity to go anywhere else. Obviously, yeah. you come as, a, as an expat working there, it's a, a limited period of time, but they, yep. it's their life, they have to stay there. Exactly, and, and, and I think that we have to be conscious of that, because they are the ones that know a lot of times. And I would say, in most cases, they know what's possible. So I think that it's important that those responses, and that this was the case, are led by uh, the people that live there and work there. Because, I mean, you will leave, but they are there. Absolutely. They, somebody needs to provide that uh, continuity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the good thing is that they speak Spanish. So for me, it was really nice and easy to communicate with them. Because a lot of them go to Spain for for school or for high school exchanges and a lot of them have family in Spain so there is a, a tight connection between them and Spain so it's a it's a nice community they're super nice it's called Saharawis and they are they're really super nice people yeah. and then you were in Mozambique also in a kind of a conflict setting right yeah, yeah. you were in the northern part of Mozambique Can yeah you tell us first of all what's going on there at the moment yeah so this is a little bit different from Algeria because in Algeria I was working with the refugees that are on the non-conflict side of the border, right? So they flee from west to east to Algeria 
where in the, and the conflict is on the west, on the uh, side of the territory of West Sahara. In this case, in Mozambique, the province of Cabo Delgado since 2017 has been under a little bit of uh, what would used to what was at the moment a little of conflict uh, between the government and Al Shabab. So it's a branch of Al Shabab and the Islamic uh, yeah. militia group, it's, uh, yeah. originating, I think, from Somalia from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, correct. And between 2017 and 2020, uh, it was relatively small, but it was there were a lot of people being displaced. And in 2020 and 2021, that escalated. And now the province that normally has roughly 2 million people living there and now has about 900,000 that are displaced. So 45% of the population of this region that is one of the poorest regions within one of the poorest countries in the world has been deeply affected by this. And, and you see the usual suspects of... Uh, violence by this type of groups that generates really uh, terror in the population and people are extremely affected psychologically, of course, by violence. So it's, um, it's, it's a complicated situation and, and there is a lot of suffering going on there. And it's important to, to also highlight that there are many conflicts going on around the world and this one is not getting a lot of attention. And of course, this is a matter of proportion of uh, conflict. So of course, in Ukraine, there's a lot going on and it's terrible. And there is also stuff going on in other places. And I think it's important to, to highlight those places because 900,000 people are being displaced there. So it's, it's a lot of people. And uh, tell us then about your assignment. What were you doing there? Yeah, so I deployed again with uh, Gorn to the Dolly Cho uh, Incident Management Office in, in Cabo Delgado, which was a team of roughly 10 people. And we were working with the government, hand in hand really with the Mozambican government to set up and strengthen the surveillance systems. So we met with, the, the way this will work is you, you meet with them and then you ask them what their needs are and what their priorities are. And they told us that they wanted to strengthen surveillance and actually go to the hospitals to check the health records to, to see what were diseases that being, were being affected and they were affecting the populations the most and then see if there were needs for response. So our work on a day-to-day -day basis, what it was, it was we would go to the hospitals that were either in the city of Pemba, so the capital of the region, or around the city of Pemba, more or less 50 to 100 kilometers. We would look at the health records, see how many cases of potential suspected polio cases, suspected cholera, diarrhea. We also looked at dog bites and rabies, and, and I can tell you more about that specifically later and measles and, and, and all the epidemic prone diseases that you get on um, displaced populations, so IDPs in this case. So we work with the government and then go back, uh, present that data uh, with the government. So we always tra travel with one of them. And then we will go and verify that the data were correct and whether that data were being sent to the central level and whether samples were actually being collected. So for polio, because at that time there was, a, and I think it's still going, polio outbreak in Mozambique. So wild polio. So we wanted to also check whether it was being spread to to Cabo Delgado, and and that was what we were doing. So we we'll check if the samples were actually being sent to South Africa, and whether the the turnaround times were being uh, kept. Did you then see that there was a concrete action for uh, you know when they received this data? Was there then uh, concrete health interventions um, that were tailored then uh, according to this data? Yeah. So that was one that I want to tell you about, which is rabies. So as I mentioned, I'm a vet, so then for me, of course, these are topics that I'm very passionate about. But when we were there, there was uh, an alert of someone that had died with rabies-like symptoms, so a person. And then we realized that there were actually quite a few more in a district within Cabo Delgado. So Mueda, which is in the north of Cabo Delgado, had been affected the most by displacement of uh, IDPs, so they had a large population of IDPs, so internally displaced people in, in that district. And they had quite a few cases of people that had died with uh, symptoms like rabies. So rabies is normally confirmed by laboratory, but that only happens in Maputo, in the capital, which is a 10-hour car drive plus a two-hour flight. So that never gets confirmed. So when we got alerted of this by the government, we called FAO and the Ministry of Agriculture, because interventions are done at the animal health level. 
and we informed them about what's going on. We got a, a round table of them, and when, then we deployed uh, a mission from agriculture, health, FAO, and WHO to this district in Muera. With an outbreak investigation, we found double the number of cases of rabies that we had actually observed at the beginning, and then decided to conduct a, a mass vaccination campaign for dogs. We arranged for, for FAO to pay for this vaccination campaign, so then, two weeks before I left, we did all the logistics for organizing the campaign, and they went to the district of Muera and Chiure and vaccinated, well, one to vaccinate uh, 100% of the dog population. I think they reached a coverage of uh, 60%, which is pretty good. And then they followed with some more actions on responsible dog ownership, which means trying, aiming to castrate dogs so that they don't keep reproducing, of course, keeping dogs as domestic dogs and not just stray dogs, which means that they don't have owners, which is mainly the cycle of rabies, and then also limiting the feeding points. And then the other really cool part was that the, the challenge with rabies is that unless you have a confirmation, which happens through laboratory, it's really hard to push governments to do something about it. And then because the government was the one leading the response here, they were very interested in actually pushing to get in diagnostics. So then we managed to get, again through FAO, rapid diagnostic tests that they could use in the field. And then they were being trained now in the field to use these diagnostics. And I'm not sure if that has reached somewhere, but at the time I left, we were linking with some, fr some friends in PAHO, uh, so the Pan American Health Organization, to get human post exposure prophylaxis from Brazil to Mozambique for free. So then that, that was actually an impactful story. Uh, we managed to get vaccination in dogs, stop the cycle of transmission. We set up the communication channels between animal and health authorities, human health authorities. We got the diagnostics and then hopefully um, the vaccines get there. I'm, I'm not sure if they got or not, but at least now they have the contacts and they can and get them. Yeah. This is a high risk setting that you've been working in. Or did you feel that you were ever, it was, did you fear for your own security at some point? I would say no. Of course, if you go there, you accept that there are certain risks and that the risks that you see there are higher than in your country if you're based in many European countries. But there are systems in place to protect people that work under international organizations like MSF, for example, or also the UN. So the UN is under UNDSS, which is the UN Security. I, I don't know what the acronym is, but they, they are in charge of this. We have had to ask for them to approve our travel. So each time we would go to a hospital, they had to make sure the roads were actually safe. And safe, I mean, not for driving speeds, but actually, actually safe. And then also assign us a security officer. So we had, in within the 10, 10 people that I mentioned earlier, so we had an ex Mozambican military person that was always with us. When we would go to these situations and he would clear the roads before we would go to make sure that there are no threats on the way, we always had communication through either walkie-talkies or, or telephones, depending on the circumstances. And, and it was normally more than one car, which also helps with security. But it was different than in Algeria, when in Algeria we always had a military escort. Algeria, I would say the, the security was more militarized, in which to go to the camps we had an, an, an Algerian military escort, and then in the camp we'll change to a military escort from the camp. But here it was... It was different, but it was also super standardized. So I would say, yes, it's risky. There are systems in place to protect people. But there is also, I think, the not just the physical safety aspect, but also, I think, the mental safety aspect. And for longer missions, you need rest and recover. So it's periods in which you can get out of those places and just rest. And I think that's, that's something, at least at the end of the mission, after being there for two months, felt that it was needed, yeah. It's just because you tend to normalize certain things that you shouldn't be normalizing. And I think it's, it's important to get out of those and, and come back with a fresh mind. What do you feel you've learned as an epidemiologist from this? I think you get very flexible. <laughs> yeah, I think it, you, you really get very flexible because you have to, you just have to, to be able to, to work under different circumstances to learn that you're not speaking the same language that they are. But, I mean, unless I, I speak Portuguese and, and in Algeria I was speaking French, but it's not my mother tongue. And, and of course, there are miscommunications. So you have to be patient. And 
you will miscommunicate things that they will misunderstand and they will communicate things that you will misunderstand. And I think the key thing is that it's not personal. So I learned, and I learned this before, but I still feel like one of the strongest things that you can do is not take things personally and just be nice. And people are nice. Normally things work out. And people, I think, in general are nice and they try to do the best that they can with the information they have. So if they're not doing something that you think is the best, it might just be because you have different information that they have or because they have a different view and it's fine and it's not personal. And I think that's something that it's needed to be more tolerable and, and just nice to everyone. Maybe I'm idealistic, but... <laughs> Would you recommend doing this for the, the other EPIAT fellows that are thinking about going abroad? Would go on? Is it something you would recommend? 100%. I think that there are several folds of why this is good. One of them is that we all work in a network. So countries report to ECDC uh, in, within the European Union, in countries ar around the world, that is the WHO structure in which you report to the WHO from countries. And having worked in the different levels of these organizations really helps you to appreciate the other side of the communication. And this goes back to the it's not personal and, 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 and things you need to understand how old people feel and think. But the key thing is that if you work in other organizations, if you have been in different environments, you learn that things work differently and it's okay. And, and I think that just makes you a really uh, all-round epidemiologist. And I don't think necessarily that one has to go again to um, a place which is completely different from one where you are. But I think these missions are really super interesting and are really enriching. And so I 100% I recommend. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for sharing your experiences yeah. with us, Shraki. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. Thank you for listening to ECDC On Air. If you're interested in applying for the ECDC Fellowship Programs for Epidemiologists and Microbiologists, the call for applications is about to go out very soon. Please check the ECDC website for more information. And if you want to learn more about the Fellowship Program, there's also another ECDC On Air episode called The Disease Detectives that features an interview with ECDC's Head of Fellowship Program, Adam Roth. You may also want to read the postcards from the field where fellows share their experiences of fieldwork. You'll find the links to all this material in the description of this episode.